Hello, I am K. Eagle View viewers. This is Mahesh Aditi, a geopolitical analyst. Today, we are here with another unique and niche video that not a lot of media outlets have discussed. Uh, this is going to be uh, Russia's upcoming elections, uh, 2024 elections, and how this is going to change the world politics. This is a very, very niche video, as I said in the beginning. And before uh, getting into this video, I would like to give a disclaimer. This video has been done with pure analytical perspective with, with facts and figures backed by a lot of other data. And this is not driven by any emotional attachment or emotional connection because in the, uh, in the field of diplomacy and foreign affairs, emotions should, shouldn't be dealt with. Uh, there shouldn't be any emotions at all. So I don't have any biases. I personally don't have any bias towards uh, one particular uh, political party or a leader or a politician as such. So uh, without further ado, let's dive deep into this video. So uh, from 15th to 17th of March, this year 2024, it's going to be really busy here because uh, the, uh, the Russian presidential election is going to happen. And uh, as world is expecting another presidential term for uh, Putin, a lot of other people, even we as Indians, we expect that Putin once again is going to become the president of Russia. But uh, there's actually a lot of other things that, that's happening in the background. Two or three more other candidates started to enroll, uh, give their name into the presidential candidature and they started to uh, have the presidential campaign. Uh, campaign. And this is, this is a massive wave because uh, considering the present uh, military operation in the Ukraine, uh, the Donbass region or uh, Indian government explicitly calls it as war in Ukraine. So considering the present war in Ukraine, actually if you see uh, a presidential election and that too, other politicians and other opposition parties contesting for the presidential run is a really big deal. We are going to see two or three people uh, who have actually enrolled into the presidential campaign and uh, we are going to see what impact does it have by discussing these uh, political candidates so that uh, in the future or even right now was going to be the political turn that's going to happen. So the first presidential candidate that we are going to talk about is uh, Yekaterina Dunsova. So Yekaterina Dunsova is actually an as aspiring presidential candidate. She actually came forward. Uh, she spoke that uh, she spoke of, she, she spoke a lot about uh, Russian President Vladimir, Vladimir Putin. He uh, she said that she is totally against war. Uh, in her video, she mentioned that nam nuj nam mir, which means we need peace. So she was very specific. She, she emphasized on having peace and she wanted to end this war as soon as possible. And she didn't like the approach of what uh, the current uh, president uh, Putin had done. So she is from a small town called Ruzhev from uh, Tivir Oblast. So Tivir Oblast is sort of like an outskirts of Moscow Oblast. Moscow by itself is a huge oblast huge administration and uh, Tivir is uh, outside of the Moscow Oblast I would say and uh, she's from a village, she's from a town called Rzhev so uh, one of, as I said one of her main agenda is that she doesn't support the war and she wants the war uh, to be ended um, we said war and again I'll give another disclaimer stating that we as Indians, I as an Indian, I could say that as a war because even in our G20 Delhi declaration, uh, the, from the official consensus that's been received from all the G20 member nations, India has mentioned it as war in Ukraine. So uh, the special military operation which has been addressed by the Russians, we could probably define it and we could term it as war in Ukraine as well. So let us come back to Yekaterina Dunsova. So she actually started her career as a journalist and uh, she is also she was also a member of the Siti Duma. Siti Duma is sort of like uh, in, in our Indian terminology we could call it as a municipal corporation something like that because it maintains uh, uh, the city legislature administration it's a city legislature it has a city administration sort of like what we have it as a municipal corporation we have councillors and mayors right likewise uh, they also have city duma so she actually had sort of a political uh, uh, experience in the sense she had worked as uh, uh, an administration officer in uh, city duma so from that moment onwards she gained a lot of experiences and uh, most of the russian crowd view her in a very different way 
she i wouldn't want to mention the age but she is also a mother of three and uh, she is from a remote region of uh, russia so a lot of uh, ethnic russians and people from the rural part of russia try to associate themselves with uh, yekaterina dunsova they feel that uh, one among us is uh, one among us is representing to be the president of russia uh, this breaks the stereotype of a lot of bureaucracy that's getting in that's being involved for several decades uh, people from st petersburg and moscow view russia in a different way than what people in rural russia view their politics and view their economy so this has been very consistent and uh, to break this practice yekaterina dunsova is viewed as uh people's sort of a presidential candidate um uh, and for this particular thing if you see to first of all get registered there are certain criteria uh, that needs to be fulfilled the first is uh, we uh, he or she needs to get a pre approval of close to 500 signature to the election commission that is the central election commission uh, the russian central election commission so uh, just to convey the interest of being part of the presidential run they should get 500 signatures and after that, the second step is to register as a presidential candidate one must submit close to 300000 i'm repeating 300000 that is 3 lakh signatures to the election commission this is really important because um without proper support or without proper backing up a presidential candidate is not is considered to be unfit uh without having a majority of uh, backup with you so 300000 seems to be a good number but i'll come back to the figure later and the third thing is um this should be done within a gap of one and a half months this is the problem which yekaterina dunsova had because uh, we can say 300000 signatures could be submitted but 300 signatures should be submitted uh, to the election commission uh, before the end of jan 2024 that is she had announced this in november i guess in november end she had uh, october to november uh, october end or the beginning of november she had announced that such a presidential candidate uh, could uh, will be run by her but uh, the time constraints is the major thing that she had as an uh, as an obstacle because by the end of january she is supposed to submit those uh, 300000 signature within close to one and a half to two months which is a very big deal and uh, she couldn't do it possibly and uh, by the end of that period she actually denied the registration of the presidential candidature so which means that she was barred to run the presidential election uh, this was one of the most uh, i would say disappointing move for all the russians across russia because uh, a mother of three and a normal woman uh, found it very difficult to get into the presidential uh, race so this is one of the major uh, turnouts and uh, i will discuss about this particular uh, politics later i don't want to get deep into this politics because it has lot of nuances which lot of common people wouldn't understand but still i would come to these figures later and i'll explain you the reason why uh, the next candidate that we are going to see is a uh, Boris Nadezhdin uh Boris Nadezhdin if you see he is another candidate he is basically from the uh, Moscow Oblast so he had actually previously worked in state duma so we had seen uh, Yekaterina Dunsova worked in city duma right he had worked in state duma state duma is sort of like the lower house and uh, federal Federa- federal council federation council is like sort of like an upper house so uh, in order to compare the presidential form of thing we could compare it with the united states in united states you have senate and house of representative right senate is the upper house and house of representative is the lower house likewise you have state duma which is a lower house and federation council which is an upper house so he had actually worked in state duma so he even ran uh, 2003 russian legislative election in the moscow oblast so he had quite a good experience uh, unfortunately in the 2003 election uh, he lost it but he had good experience uh, almost uh, two decades back uh, running into these uh, elections legislative elections in moscow oblast so if you see uh, both of these candidates have a lot of things in common you go to boris nadezhdin's uh, manifesto he had actually uh, listed a lot of things one of the main things he had listed is uh even he doesn't support war 
he says he wants peace a uh, permanent peace that too and he wants to end that war this is one of the major things that he had highlighted in the election manifesto you can go to nadish din 2024.com uh, that is the particular website uh, it is his uh, website website portal for uh, his uh, show, showcasing his election manifesto you can go and view in that portal uh, nadish din 2024.com so here you can see that uh, he had also mentioned a lot of other manifestos as well uh, which has a great geopolitical impact and we'll come back to that later so if you see uh, he is actually now part of the civic initiative party this is one of the minority parties we can consider but it is one of the major opposition party that is the civic initiative party he is part of the party and according to it if you see uh, when he comes into election uh, uh, presidential race he has the criteria of getting close to 100000 signatures to the election commission uh, now we can come to the previous thing which we had discussed uh, uh, just a minute back i had mentioned that uh, 3 lakh uh, signature that is 300000 signature was required by ekatrina uh, donsova right in this case for uh, baris nadesh then only 100000 signatures were required which is almost one third so we can see the amount of experience that you gain uh, through moscow oblast that is wherever you contest uh, increases your perk and increases your rank so she had served in Serb Oblast, Ekaterina served in Serb Oblast and she had received a bar of 300,000 signature uh, whereas uh, Baris Nadishdin, he just got one third of it, one lakh signature, that's it, 100,000 signature and you can, I don't want to go deep into this politics again because uh, if you see one third of uh, requirement might be because of his experience in State Duma um, that is uh, trying to have his own experience in lower house and his experience in lower house has paved a significant way to have one third of uh, Ekaterina's uh, requirement. So this is the thing that we are seeing right now. This uh, was very fascinating. So that's why I just want to highlight this. And the next thing is that uh, uh, we are we are going to go to the findings uh, but before going into the findings this hasn't been new to the to the russians as well as to the world audience because uh, we could see that in 2018 alexei navalny uh, i think most of us would have heard that name alexei navalny uh, he had he tried to run uh, the presidential campaign in 2018 but sadly, uh, his uh, application was actually rejected by the election commission, stating that he already had a track record of, he had already had criminal records and uh, criminal cases, and one with criminal cases couldn't enroll into uh, a presidential campaign and a presidential race. So unfortunately, he was being jailed. You have a lot of other conspiracy theories stating that he was being poisoned uh, and uh, uh, he was uh, he was treated in a very ill manner and so on and so forth. But let us not go into it. Uh, we can say for sure that uh, he had a lot of criminal records and because of that he was barred from running the election campaign. Uh, so this is the facts that we have right now. So whatever I had said till now are the facts. Let us get to the findings part right now. So the first finding that uh, we could see the main similarity is that the opposition parties and the politicians they actually unite each other okay uh, they actually uh, uh, they integrate themselves with uh, a lot of other ideologies they unite and they support Boris Nadezhdin that's because not just Russian politicians even the Russian people they wanted to change that uh, some way or the other um, we could see a, democra a democratic principle that's upheld in the Russian society and in the Russian government. This is just one section of the society. Obviously, uh, people uh, or Russians above the age 50, they support Putin because they know what Putin is capable of. Uh, but one section of the society, I'm talking about mostly the youngsters, they support uh, Boris Nadezhdin because they want to see a change. But uh, Russians above 50, 55, 60, most of the senior citizens, they support Putin. We could see actually, we could see the trend uh, historically. So one finding is that the opposition party, no matter if their ideology matches or not, because uh, we have left, we have far left, 
we have center far right and we have right so we have all these segregations but beyond these segregations a lot of opposition party despite having difference of opinions and despite having different ideologies the opposition as such want to support Anadhyash Din. So this is one of the major findings that we could see. So this is regarding the internal uh, findings that we have. So let us go deep into the world politics. How does this particular election determine the world politics? First thing is uh, the liberals and the anti-war versus the anti-West. Uh, if you see uh, in, the, in the previous video uh, in uh, MMK uh, uh, Major Sir had clearly explained what a woke culture is. So woke culture is actually uh, increased and a uh, lot of uh, ideological warfare has been undergoing in the recent days specifically in Russia. So if you see there's a lot of liberals who are anti-Putin. Uh, and some people who are anti-war so there's a clear segregation wherein russians are they going to be anti-war or anti-west so this is one of the major dilemma that they are going to face internally because uh, if people who are not supporting putin who want putin to come out of his uh, uh, leadership if they come in will they support west or will they going to end the war that is the major question that they have or even if people who are anti-war are they going to be also anti-West if they were to come in power the presidential candidate uh, in this case uh, Boris Nadezhda uh, we can take this case hypothetically if he comes into power will he will he in future gonna support USA he says that he is gonna end the war but even after ending the war will he support the West or uh, is he going to uphold the Russian ideology by not aligning with the West but still ending the war? So this is the major dilemma that uh, not just the politicians, even the people of Russia were going to have. The next is dependence on China. Um, if you see, uh, let me just quote, uh, if you go to uh, Nadeshdan 2024, as I said, I had mentioned Nadeshdan's election manifesto, right? If you go to his manifesto, he had clearly mentioned, and I quote, from the European state, it, that is Russian culture, has strived to be for centuries and Russia risks becoming a vassal of China. This is the exact words that uh, is, has been mentioned in the election manifesto of uh, Boris Nadezhdin. So uh, he is clearly, you can see he states that Russia is obviously aligning too much with China and he doesn't want that. So the previous point which I had said the anti-West might suit uh, 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 Boris Nadezhdin because more than anti-West he'll be anti-war and he'll be pro-West. So this dilemma could change, uh, this dynamics could change in the, in the near future once he becomes the president, I believe, if he becomes the president. So uh, if you see a lot of uh, dependence on China, especially the uh, economic and the political uh, relations, uh, it might see a lot of reductions. And uh, before, prior to the war, if you see most of the manufacturing components were German-made components that Russians imported mainly. But after sanctions, after the war, after the heavy imposition of sanctions, a lot of Chinese components has been flooding the Russian markets. Uh, we could all see it, like even from the Far East, starting from the Far East to the interiors of Siberia and towards uh, Moscow and other areas. If you see, Russian market is flooded by Chinese products. So, uh, so even for basic components, they're importing it from China. Most of them are, uh, uh, I would say most of them are Chinese imports and few of them are actually uh, local made, localized. They have made a lot of products in Russia as well, but uh, in, as a substitute for German products, Chinese products or Chinese, I would, I would say spare parts for manufacturing and other industries have actually uh, seen in abundance. The next thing is a lot of people haven't discussed about this that is PMC, uh, private mercenary companies or private military companies, the mercenary groups. 
uh, if we see if we look at the russian mercenary groups we all remember only one particular uh, group called uh, the wagner the wagner group or grupa wagnera uh, but after the death of evgeny prigozhin um, none of the people are none of them are talking about uh, pmcs but let's not go deep into why he had died and what is the reason behind this but he, apart from a uh, wagner group there are several other pmcs uh, whose name hasn't been revealed in the public so most of them they don't, they don't know wh- uh, how many pmcs that uh, russia have uh, because uh, russia holds a lot of other pmcs and uh, most of their names hasn't been revealed yet to the public so uh, why i'm taking this pmc into consideration is because after this particular election uh if there's a shift between Boris Nadezhdin and Putin uh there's going to be a clear sign in the PMC establishments especially in Africa if you see sub-saharan Africa and the MENA region that is Middle East and North Africa uh the presence of Russian PMCs is very huge the amount of money the Kremlin pours into these Russian uh mercenaries are huge uh, there's a think tank called CSIS, uh, Center for Strategic and Intelligence Studies. Uh, I think it's an American-owned uh, uh, think tank. So uh, that think tank, if you want to have more insights, that think tank have published more about the Russian PMCs. You can go and study about that. So uh, PMCs, especially Russian PMCs, mercenaries presence in Africa is pretty huge. So after this election, there might be a huge change in uh, the PMCs which are undertaken uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and the MENA region. And the last but not the least is obviously India. Uh, We are not going to exclude this anyways because India is going to be a vital part of this uh, particular uh, topic that we are going to discuss because um, Putin has been and uh, we hope so he is going to be an ally forever with Russia and uh, in every single meeting he has emphasized the achievements and the foreign policies of uh, the Indian leadership so if you see uh, the one main thing is the Kudangulam project uh, this all comes to the point one which I had mentioned that is uh, the anti-west or pro-west or anti-war this particular dilemma is going to affect the Kudangulam project because Kudangulam project is a nuclear project that's going to come up. Uh, West, I don't know how far they will support the nuclear program uh, because we uh, the one of the main reasons why India is aligning with France is because France will help India in nuclear projects, building nuclear submarines, so on and so forth. But we couldn't expect that from other countries. So if uh, Boris Nadezhdin or if someone else comes in replacement of Putin, there will be a doubt that arises where, wherein uh, they're gonna they're gonna align with West by banning the uh, further progress of Kudangulam project or not. Because uh, when it comes to nuclear, West is pretty clear because they are fundamentally based on how we are developed or, or how their development is based on the nuclear. So nuclear energy or building nuclear power plant is sort of like, uh, um, um, I would say, a doubtful thing uh, when a pro-West leadership comes into place in Russia. But one thing for sure is the Chennai Vladivostok project. Uh, be it anti-West or pro-West or anti-war or pro-war, whoever comes into place, the Chennai to Vladivostok project will continue. Um, the reason why I'm saying this, there are two things. So one is uh, the China factor, uh, because uh, nevertheless, even the uh, opposition parties uh, in the present uh, uh, Russian government or the leadership in the Russian government, they are to an extent, they want to have a balance act between China and India. In that case, Chennai to Vladivostok project is really, really helpful because uh, it covers a huge part of uh, China's outside territories, not China's territory at sea, but uh, it passes through Southeast Asia and it passes through the waters of uh, to the state of Taiwan and it goes all through the Korean Peninsula all the way to Vladivostok. So if you see the route from China to Vladivostok, it is very really significant. Uh, it's sort of like a counter to China. So be it pro-China or anti-China or sorry, be it pro-West or anti-West, uh, whichever government is going to come into place, they are going to support the China to Vladivostok. The second thing is, 
uh, one particular instance that happened in recent days is going to be a testament of what I have said. Uh, recently, uh, last week, that is 24th Jan, uh, the Chennai port organized India-Russia workshop on uh, operationalization of the Eastern Maritime Corridor. Uh, this is pretty much uh, evident because uh, now that Jai Shankar sir, our external affairs minister, he had visited Russia and he talked about Kurangulam and Chennai to Vladivostok project. Uh, the Chennai port had actually now recently they have organized this event. Uh, Sarbanda Sonowal, uh, he is the ho uh, Honorable Union Minister of uh, Ports, Shipping and Waterways. And uh, Mr. Antoli uh, uh, Bubrakov, Bubrakov, he is the Honorable Deputy Minister of the Development of the Far East and the Arctic. Both of them had a meeting in uh, here in Chennai. It was Taj Vivanta, I guess, in Shorinalur in Chennai. Uh, they had a meeting discussing about the uh, maritime projects um, especially the far east and the arctic uh, arctic is a long term goal but in the short term project if you see chennai to vladivostok acts as a testament of uh, the process that's going to take place in the near future so these are some of the findings that i had and these are some of the political impacts that's going to face with the president uh, with the uh, upcoming presidential election as i said I would repeat once again that I do not have bias towards any particular leader. Uh, I am a true Indian and uh, my self-interest needs to be fulfilled. And we, uh, as an, I as an Indian, I stay true to my self-interest and I stay true to my goals. And uh, this is the reason why uh, I don't go biased towards one particular country or one particular party as such or one particular region as such. Uh, we embrace both West and East together. Uh, this is the reason why uh, I would like to do an analysis based on the facts and figures. Uh, if Putin comes back to power again or if he doesn't come back to power again, uh, we are going to look into the self-interest of our nation. This is going to be my stand. Self uh, Maintaining the self-interest of India is going to be my stand. And I would like to end this video uh, right now. So if you have any comments or criticisms or any feedbacks please do let in the please let us know let us the mmk team mmk eagle view know that uh, what you're trying to convey and please do let us know in the comment section below thank you namaste jai hind